how did they do that? They did shave their heads and wear wigs, right? I'm assuming if you took the wig off, there wouldn't be any natural hair, or would there? Do we know? I guess you could tell for mummies. Some of them have hair. Um, but, some of them have hair, yeah. I think, I think that might be frequently overstated, to be honest. Um, it's like any of these things uh, when you're like, you know, you do the same thing with language where we say like, oh, we, we found the Rosetta Stone and then we deciphered hieroglyphs. Yeah, and right. like, of course, that's not the whole story. Um, <laughs> I, so they practice a lot of things. So we know they shaved frequently and razors are actually pretty common in the archaeological record. Um, they have a super distinctive shape. I, I'm going to show you all this real quick because it's kind of neat. Uh, there's one in the Met that's really nice. Um, and it's it's a hieroglyph too. So if you ever see the hieroglyph, you'll recognize it immediately. Let me share screen real quick. Um, so yeah, yeah, here's a razor. Um, I have no idea how this actually worked as a razor. Like which part is the is the actual sharp edge? I'm not sure. Is it this edge that's sharp or one of these? And then why the handle at that at this angle? I don't know. I've wondered. Good um, point. Right. Mm -hmm. Never thought about that. I mean, they're beautiful, you're right. So in one of those documentaries that I posted on Discord, I think there's a shaving scene and they're using this edge. Like, like this edge. No, oh, wait, where's my pencil? Using this edge here, which this one is, I think, broken, but there'd be an edge. They're using this to shave. And it's like, well, why do you put all that other side on there. I don't know. I seem, seems like maybe uh, one of those nobody knows type, type questions. Um, maybe it's counterweight somehow. I really, I'm very curious. What's the scale of it? It looks enormous. It's um, Is it nailed? like, Mustafa, what did you just say? Uh, is this a nailed or just uh in the other part uh, i mean the bigger eraser part i don't think i understand your question uh, i just said uh the razor two parts actually yeah oh are they nailed together nailed. yeah they they are connected yeah they they can't be separated um, and Aaron, to your question, scale, uh, this would be held in the hand. So this is, this thing is roughly the size of a small hair dryer, I suppose. Huge. Yeah, it's really big. The, it looks like a the, weapon. Yeah, the bronze edge is, is huge. Um, and kind of like inexplicably huge. I think this is the shaving edge here. But then why do you need all the rest of it? I wonder if they sharpen it a lot and it shortens. So that's just to extend its life because I have to keep it really sharp and it gradually gets smaller. Yeah. Well, if my initial thesis is wrong and they, they basically didn't just uh, shave off their hair and wear a wig on top, um, which I've been considering because that could be much easier than what I'm doing right now. Um, in any case, if that is true, how would you cut the normal hair then? Could this thing do somehow somehow do double duty or are there any any shears anything to actually clip hair with ever found i'm wondering is it just for the beard or could it be for for the for longer tresses as well i have no idea i don't know these i share some of these questions uh, in terms of shears they must have had shears because at this time they were producing wool and long before they were producing wool mm -hmm. i don't know how else you get the hair out of a sheep um except with shears ask nicely <laughs> yeah yeah I don't, I don't see another way to solve that problem um mm -hmm. but i can't think of having seen ancient egyptian shears i'm just going to search google real quick and see what we find oh boy i managed to get one. one oh there look you at go. these look at that okay so mystery solved they had they had shears. i think they i think they had shears like proper shears like this um yeah and there's some with plastic handles amazing i didn't know they had that yeah. <laughs> so advanced they got um, the petroleum from from uh, mesopotamia so it's okay 
So, okay, where did we start with this question? We we're, we we're talking about like the hairlessness. Um, lots of mummies have hair. Actually, I think most, I mean, I haven't counted obviously, but um, I'm sure someone has, there's been plenty of written about ancient Egyptian hair, but like, so the general thing that you're told is like they shaved or uh, we know that they practice depilation also, which is like they, they plucked hair, um, but they probably didn't always. And so it's kind, of, it's kind of overstated a little bit. So Herodot's nonsense again. <laughs> I think Herodotus is um, mostly telling the truth. I might be kind of the odd man out in that, in that belief. Um, I mean, he's very often reporting outlandish things, but I think if, if someone says something outlandish to you and you then write down, so-and-so said this, it doesn't really make you a liar. You're just, you're just like reporting information a bit uncritically. But he also got a lot of things the, right. The Margaret Murray story about uh, all the teenage antics people were getting up to in the anthropology group she was studying, and it turned out they were just trying to entertain her with this kind of story she wanted to hear. So it was all yeah. fictional. Yeah. And you definitely get that in some of his stories where he, like, you've got this random traveler asking you questions. And it's like, oh, yeah, if you go just over that next ridge, there's, there's giant ant men, <laughs> just huge ants that, like, they have their own ant civilization. And he's like, really? Wow. <laughs> Man, this guy would fall <laughs> for anything. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Anyway. Um, trying to remember where we were. I think we finished, I think we got to right here last time, if I remember correctly. Okay. So let me see, do I have a volunteer who would like to continue reading on? Trying to see who's avoiding eye contact. Well, I can do the next sentence, maybe not the thing after it. Okay, shouldn't have told me that. But yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we can try. But uh, so we're at the winning ta uh, passage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so winning ta pa passage, her jed in banab jedu, nature a a ank. So, so then the Aeneid um, said to uh, Banab Jedu, the great god, the living one, I guess, the great living god, maybe. He sure. ear into uh, Wetu, I guess. Wepu? Yeah, Wepu. Wepu to. And yep. zap. What kind of zap? Uh, what kind of zap? Yeah, I was just I was just prompting you for the next word. Okay. And you said it already. Ta so. ushet, ush, <laughs> ushet, something like that. Wa maat. Or ma'u or something like that. Ma'a. Yeah. Ma 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 I guess if you wanted to do, you know, kind of the standard. If you wanted to literally Egyptianize it. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what this says. <laughs> Okay, uh, so you you already translated up to e, here. So e2 is like, yeah. okay. What is, um, what is, what is ear? Let's, let's start with just this part. Do, yeah. do make, cause. Okay, and then we put the e, e on the front. That can do a few things. It can give us a, a relative form. It, it can give us a, think of it as, Generally speaking, it sort of turns the verb into an adjective. 
um, or a substantive of some sort. Um, generally, when you put that E on the front. So it can do a few different things, but they're all kind of like where they are connected together is that you take a simple conjugated verb and you turn it into something um, that can uh, be sort of like uh, subordinated. Think of it like, um, like a function handle. You're a computer programming person, yeah. right? Like in JavaScript, I can like, create a variable that contains within it a function and then I can pass that function. as like a callback to another function, right? Okay, that's kind of what E does. Okay. It creates like a, a conjugated verb handle that I can now take and do other things with. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that works once we get further into this sentence. But pretend, it's, pretend that this isn't here just for now. And uh, so what would we have if we had ear to by itself? Ear to, so that would be just, just like you do it or something like that so they're asking so you're you're thinking of two to something? you're thinking of two Wrong like two. the state of two ending i'm thinking of this as the in, in the sedgemf form which is what we're pretending this is for now um two is a specific suffix pronoun actually specific was the exact wrong choice of word there it is a deliberately non-specific <laughs> suffix pronoun but it is one of the suffix pronouns Okay, I don't remember which one it is. So this is, but this is an indefinite one. It's the one that that we often translate as uh, one, quote unquote, one. Okay. Or it can be the passive. So like, ear two, two is just like an unknown person, someone. So one does, or may one do, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. So one did. And what? One what did. did. They do? Wepu, is that open? That's a different web. Uh, so in this case, okay. we have, um, it, it looks pretty much the same though. So it's a little tricky. But in this case, we have the man with hand to mouth classifier, which makes it the web. That means like uh, to, to command or determine in this case, uh, or judge in this case, judge. judge. Discern, okay. something like this. Okay. So judge the two who are upon the usacht. And then what is this two? It's different, different from this two, unfortunately. We got a lot of twos going on okay. in late Egyptian. You can <laughs> okay. actually I, tell, I, I'm, I mean, it, I'm not, I'm not like- Because it's plural? It's the, yeah, it's the third person plural. So it's the, the, um, the direct object pronouns of late Egyptian, right? You have a two sort of morphine, with a suffix pronoun on it. I think we talked about it last time. It's like a, yeah. it's a generalization of this T that occurs on the infinitive of the third week class has now been generalized uh, to other verb forms. In this case, it actually is a third week verb form. So it, it should be here. Um, but whatever the case, we have this new class of uh, suffix, I'm sorry, uh, direct object pronouns that form as a result of this, okay. of putting the, the two and then the suffix wrong. So this is really, if I were to transcribe it, I would transcribe it to oo. Okay, W for the plural strokes. And so that's yeah. third person plural. So judge In this them case, more. Like I'm kind of contradicting okay. myself because I normally don't put a W for the plural strokes, but in this case, mm -hmm. it actually it actually does mean oo and, and it survives all the way to Coptic as oo. Okay. Okay, so, so ear to wepu, so wepu to oo. Ear to to wepu to oo. Okay, so um, so what was wepu again? It's it's not judge. It's um. I would say judge here. You would say judge here. Okay. So. So they should be judged. You should ju or judge them. Okay, one should judge them. One did the two of judge them. them. And now did we can judge. actually we can actually go back now and see what this does. Um, this sort of nominalizes the verb, so it makes it. Um, in English, there's lots of different ways uh, to nominalize a verb. We could have 
uh, to do or doing or uh, that one did or what one did. All of those are, are sort of ways of taking a conjugated verb and turning it into like a noun that you can then place into a syntactic structure differently. In this case, I would translate it very literally as what one did was to judge them. Okay. I know it's I know it's kind of messy, so, but if you think about so the Ennead is speaking to Baneb Jedu and they're saying what one did is to judge them. Yeah. Why is this in the past? Um well. I mean, even if we didn't have a, the verb marking the past, we actually have a really good literal indication of the past here, M. Septepi. M. Septepi. Again. Just, um, that, mm, trying to think of how to make that work. So what is, uh, what is Depi? A pawn, one who is a pawn. It can mean right. that. Uh, it comes from a word that means <laughs> okay. head. It can also be just first. So the Zep oh, okay. is the, the first occasion. So. Oh, okay, so he's judged this before? Yeah, um, I mean, we can, we can kind of zoom out in a little bit and see how this makes sense in the context of the story. But what it says is, um, more loosely, they were judged at the first time, or for the first time, whatever, however we want to translate it. They, this has been decided before. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's what the Egyptian says. They were judged at the first time. Uh, literally, what one did is judging them in, in the first occasion. And then in the first occasion, by or in the Usecht, I don't know what that is, some kind of building, palace. Yeah, it, well, it, uh, Wessex just court. means broad. So yeah, it's like a, it's a court. And then this is the name of right, the Right, this court. is like the, the big hall thing. Yeah. The, the hall of truth. Yeah. And then the, the, the court is called um, one, Ma'ats or unique Ma'ats. Yeah, whatever that means. It's the name of the place. So they were judged at the first occasion, um, which probably means like the beginning of time. Uh, in the court, uh, the truths are unique. Or all, all truths are one. Oh, that's good. Aurelio, <laughs> got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to propose that, or rather ask the question, the why is that, so if you wanted to say, quick grammar exercise, if you wanted to say one house, would it be, would it be wa per or something? I think yes. so, right? The, the wa comes before the, the noun, not after. It does, and, yes. Okay, so one truth, that could be one truth, but could it be interpreted as a verb? Like you just said, the truth yeah. is one, like yeah. the Lord is yeah. one, basically. I one is weird with the plural strokes on ma'at, right? So it is. So you you can't you can't read it as a truths because that's obviously contradictory, and Egyptian grammar doesn't really do that. I mean, we can make it in English too, but it just it's it just immediately doesn't make sense. So this must be it's making a statement about the truths, right? It's not it's not inherently the case that truths is singular. We're saying that truths are singular. So that can be a verb. Um, it can be, I think it has to be like a SEGMF adjective verb. So the truths have become one. All truths are one. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Could Ma'a be written twice there? Like, could it be the one truth of the truths? One of the like truths. The first quadrat is ma'at, and the second quadrat is ma'out. But it's oh, one truth of the truths. Yeah, that could be that could be true too. That's that's a possible reading of this. I think it's not the way I read it, but um, yeah, I, I don't see anything wrong with that. We might expect some okay. sort of classifier to make that clear. Like we would expect something to end this word here, 
Uh, it very much looks right. like this is all one word, but you know, having said that, I've certainly seen cases where it wasn't clear to me that they were really supposed to be two words and other people have read them as two words. So it wouldn't surprise me. This is um, a construction very much like this is where you get the Coptic preterite. If you think about like Al Shope, they they came into being. It's Iru Pepper. They did becoming early. Um. Not exactly the same, but it's pretty close to it. So it's it's not an um, it's not an especially frequent construction, but it's frequent enough that um, it's it's easily identifiable as that. And it is, so basically what happened is the, the sejimef as the simple past tense kind of falls out of use and gets supplanted by this paraphrastic form where you use the verb to do, the sejimef form of the verb to do, and then you add an infinitive to it. In year two plus infinitive, right? Yeah, if we put a different subject here, um, uh, iref weputu, he judged them, that would just be, um, th that would basically be the Coptic, more or less unchanged. So yeah, not too weird. Okay. So, so what was done is that they were judged the first time in the Hall of tr Truths, or one yeah. truth, or truths or one, or something. Yeah. Sounds very mythological. Okay. I don't know why he's saying this right now. Well, the Ennead is saying this to Banab Oh, yeah, okay. that's right. Sorry, I lost track. So yeah, they're, they're, they're saying it to him. Yeah, so they've called him out and they're going to ask him to do something and he needs to do something because these people were already judged before and so you need to make that happen again. I think. Maybe yeah, no Peter just said, it seems like this has already been decided. It does seem like that. It seems like the answer is a sort of foregone conclusion. Um, this is not too surprising. So it's something we see all over the place in um, in Egyptian stories, in uh, magical texts. I think we did a ma oh we did a magical text in the Coptic reading group uh, where it was kind of this like it was a retelling of a mythological story, but then the the person using the magical text was trying to kind of recreate that mythological story in their own circumstances. Um, uh, Peter is rooting for for set so. <laughs> I remember reading this in translation and it was, I found it fascinating that um, like when we tell modern mythology stories, we want the characters to be consistently people as if they were in the story. And in this story, the characters in the story know they're in a story. They know what kind of story this is. They know how it's going to end and they're just going through acting it out. And so they kind of, it's not breaking the fourth wall, but kind of breaking the world they're in. But this is occasional references to like they know how it's going to come out yeah and of course Horus is the rightful king so he has to win and we're all rooting for him because that's you know the, that's the establishment but i mean this is you know we we might think of this as like a modern sort of thing um like if if i were to write say a short story where everyone in the story knew they were in a story you would say oh that's very artsy sort of storytelling um but you know, it's it's nothing new. It's that's very much a part of ancient stories. It's really often the case hmm. that people know what's going to happen next, even the people in the story. Yeah, it's neat. Yeah, it's really different. I'm trying to think of modern stories like that, there are quite a few. Uh, the one that jumps to mind for me is uh, the movie Eight and a Half, which is like kind of a meta story where like the main character is. It's like uh, Fellini's movie about him making the movie that you're watching. And then there's like art critics coming in who are critiquing the movie that you're watching at the time. It's one of my all time favorite movies. It's so good. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Adaptation is like that. And oh, adaptation. Where yeah. He's writing a, the first half is he's really struggling to write the screenplay. And then the second half is his brother takes over writing the screenplay and the movie changes to be like his brother's version of the screenplay. Yeah. Uh, Stranger it's, Than it's Fiction really too. 
Yep. The Will Ferrell movie, Stranger Than Fiction, that's also happening. Quick question on grammar, if I may. Um, of course. So basically, it starts with an E. So um, this is an emphatic form, right? Are those like um, second tenses in Coptic, or are they beginning to be like second tenses in Coptic? So does this emphasize something like it is in the, I'm just going to use that horrible periphrastic construction in English, um, it is in the um, in the hall of justice that this was decided the first time or something of of that nature? Yeah, it could be. They're, they're not... Um, they're not actually the direct predecessor of the Coptic second, second tenses. Like if you follow etymologically, that's not the case. So it's a little, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a little tricky. Um, but I think it's generally believed, you know, I don't even know at this point, I get so confused about this because there's this whole thing, like the reason that we have, um, you know, like the standard theory view of Middle Egyptian is basically projecting the, the understanding of the second tenses from Coptic backwards on the assumption that it must have always kind of been a part of the language. If it's a part of the language later, I don't buy that premise. Mm -hmm. um, but then even Egyptologists who do read things that way also don't buy that premise. But it, it strikes me that in order to argue that, the premise is sort of necessary for that argument. So I don't fully understand how people argue for those things in Middle Egyptian while simultaneously rejecting the premise that we must find some equivalent of the Coptic second tenses in earlier stages of the language. Because if we don't, without that premise, um, why should we expect to find it? Cool. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, so it, it always confuses me. Um, but in the case of late Egyptian, these uh, like, oh, what's the word for it? Um, prophetic yod type sejimefs are not the ancestors of the second tenses, but they're often believed to work like the second tenses. Mm -hmm. So your translation, I think, is good. Um, I'm just I'm just cautioning that you know, lest you believe that like these things are sort of historically connected, they aren't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like the the e at the beginning of this verb is not the epsilon of the Coptic. No, that's cite that's second that. tense, right? Right. I mean, for that I would expect some kind of some kind of eu or well right. depends. Mm -hmm. uh, but then that's also not the case. Like the eu in late Egyptian is not the equivalent of the of the um, emphatic verb form. Right. Hmm. It's the circumstantial. So. Uh, it's just, it's confusing. And I've never, no, no one, in my opinion, has figured it out. So uh, I don't feel bad about not having figured it out, but like, if you can figure it out, more power to you. Um, I don't think the second tenses in Coptic do that. As you know, I've, I'm sure I've told you this before. Yep. I don't think that's what the second tenses do either. I think that's a side effect. Um, so like, I reject the whole, like I reject the reading of second tenses in Coptic. So, you know, then, apply that to late Egyptian, you're, you're kind of like, you have this kind of, like everything is sort of thinning. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. Mm. A lot has been written about that. Um, okay, no, no, cool, thanks. Just wanted to make sure I have the right form here, but yeah, that's, that's a very good point. And you're right, we may be interpreting things back into, into the paradigm because we think, well, they're two different verb forms, so they must mean something. I wonder what future grammarians of English will make out of the difference between I will go, I shall go, and I'm going to go, which, yeah. I mean, if anything, there's a stylistic difference, but that's it. But I'm sure there will be tones about that, the, the um, semantic implications of each. Yeah, and imagine if you were to look at, say, um, a, a book, like a novel written by a British author in the late 19th century, you could, you could very precisely distinguish between their use of shall and will. Because uh, they're using them in specific ways, but if you were to read the the writing of someone writing today, um, then they're not. That's not true anymore. They've kind of merged into like one is sort of a more formal version of the other. Now, when we're looking at Egyptian, we're always looking through time, and we're putting those two things side by side, and saying like, well, sometimes it works this way, and sometimes it doesn't. So, is this how it works? We can't really tell because we're all our evidence is just mixed together. Yeah, it's tricky.
Uh, we'll definitely see more of those. I mean, maybe by the time we finish reading these texts, I'll, I'll have an answer. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, that's why we do it, right? Cue next sentence. Okay, I'm going to do. Can I ask about the hieratic? Yeah, that's what I was going to do next. Um, okay. So these, yeah, I, I think, are all straight. About, uh, I was going to ask about the eagle and the red bull. The, two, the eagle sorry. and the red bull. No, no, the <laughs> the eagle and the red uh, bread loaf. Um, eagle and the bread loaf here. Yeah, so uh, where it's just an extra squiggle. Yeah, yeah. And I was also going to point out the the ma. So, for instance. Um, yeah, this right here was a little bit surprising to me, just how it's almost like written over the top of each other. And then this- It's got like a tail on top now. Yeah, yeah. It's not then, like this, it's here. Yeah. And then they, um, yeah, the, the T and the Aleph, like you just mentioned. Um, so you got the, the T I think is quite clear. And then for the, for the Aleph bird, you basically just have this kind of Z shape thing, but it makes sense if you look at like uh, even clearer versions of the Aleph bird, you'll often get this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, like the head is just a single line and then you have the back of the bird and then the legs. So basically mm -hmm. what they've done here is they've shortcutted that even further to get that. Mm -hmm. And then when they're ligatured, um, you get this just like squiggles. Three mm. kind of three horizontal lines connected. Yeah, I thought the plural strokes next to the house as well were interesting. Uh, so right here. Yeah. Yep. Um, cool. mm -hmm. <laughs> I I like seeing this uh, for plural strokes, um, but. The variance is is fine. <laughs> I'm just getting used You're to it. You're okay with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we 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 wish that the higher attic were clearer. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe we wish it. Maybe we don't. I mean, it's kind of the fun of higher attic is that it just looks like scribble until you can see what it is, and then it it like clicks, and it's satisfying, in my opinion. Yeah. Ma feathers were interesting too. Just how it it started out kind of over and then it got more solid into the recognizable feather yeah um, i'm not sure of the stroke order here but it's um it's basically something like this right that's the that's uh -huh. the odd feather shape uh -huh. and then they do them so quickly and sloppily that you end up with something like that sometimes mm -hmm. It's still made up of the same stuff, but it's just morphed enough that it no longer yeah. looks like the thing. Sure. The wall Sorry, looks really good. Do my audio really fast. This um, this papyrus scroll looks really nice. It's got like a big tick on top. Makes it very clear that that's what that is. Okay, let me, I'm just gonna align them all real quick so we can all be sure that we're looking at the same things. Um, the, the, I forget which one that is, like N7 or whatever, the, the sun disc with the Uraeus on it is really nice. They even put a little Uraeus and a nice, it's normally written in two parts. Like, I'm not sure which order they go in, but it's the, the left and the right are written separately. Uh, but here they've actually made a circle, which doesn't always happen. Um, the gods are good, the falcon on a stick is clear, then there's the three, which is like just the falcon on a stick with an extra line. Um, gosh, the hair doesn't look like itself at all to me, but that's got to be what it is. Jed, N, that's a nice N, you don't always get such nice an N. Uh, all these are good. Neb is a really nice Neb, it's really nice. They've done, I guess it's here, and then here, and then line in the middle. The Jeds are always nice. Let's see, these all look good. We've seen them before. 
those all look like what they are. I mean, this hieratic is especially legible, especially for a late Egyptian hieratic text. It's, it's really quite good. Well, I was going to ask you about the X. Sending the legible one. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> the X next to Wep, Wepu. Yeah. Uh, it's like it, it's half the X that goes down into the scroll. Yeah. Is that what I'm seeing? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so does the, the X mean there was like a more complicated de determinative there and hieroglyphic, but they're just abbreviated it? Uh, no, nope, that that's term just how you spell the word. That's it. That's part of the word. It is a hieroglyphic sign. Okay. Just an, it just looks like an X. Um, I mean, keep in mind, they didn't have our alphabet. So, um, you know, it's, it's no, it's not weird because it doesn't look like anything to them. It just looks like another hieroglyph. Um, it's used in, I, I would have to go through the dictionary um, I associate it with the word sewa, which is how you type it also is SW capital A, sewa, which means like to pass or to cause to go away. It's a causative of Y to be far away, uh, but it's in a bunch of words. I'm not sure what it means. You know, with these, with these um, kind of general classifier type signs, you can often sort of say what it means and then relate that to the form in some way. I don't I don't have a mental model like that for this one. But it, it it just goes with like it makes sense to me that it goes with this word, but I can't say why, unfortunately. Um the depth is really cool. This is a great this is a great depth. So the way this looks a lot of times is you'll see like a little face. Sometimes they'll put little lines for the facial features, uh, even on like really high quality, um, like in Tutmosis III's uh, burial chamber where they had these really nice, um, what is it? Like the Amduat or whatever. Um, they have really nice drawings of people that are written to look like a, a scribe's brush on papyrus. They draw all the faces with like two lines on them. And I guess that's like eyes and mouth. It's not really clear. It's kind of a schematic face. Um, so you'll see that a lot of times, and then just with like a big beard and, or with the back of the head. So here we've got like a little curve for the head itself, back of the head, and then just like a huge, huge beard, um, which I enjoy because I'm a fan of big beards, as you might've guessed. Uh, this quail chick looks weird, but it is the, you know, we might expect a middle Egyptian quail chick to look more like this. And here we've got the backstroke almost totally vertical, and then the feet just stuck onto the front of it. Um, all the rest look pretty good. Looks pretty good. Uh, this looks a, a little wonky, but it's T. They've done just the bare minimum. They've done something like this. They've done the bare minimum to give you a T. Actually, they went like way over here and then just gave you like a little tiny thing. Uh, house looks good. Pearl sign. Yeah, it's all there. Eventually we're going to get to the point where we start looking at the hieratic first. We're not there yet. We might there, not even get there. Oh, go ahead. The, oh, what is that word again? Uh, the tepi, the zepi tep, mm -hmm. uh, the primeval time, um, that, two dashes next to the head is that to me looks like a man or like an abbreviated man sign underneath the the, the p sign yeah that right there is that's the two slashes that's the yod right or the double yeah root. and it's really tricky because you have like the width of the brush in there um what what we actually see here it looks something like this um but you can imagine that what they were going for was this, which often ends up looking kind of like that. And they just, this last dash, instead of going uh, down into the left, they've gone down into the right. So it, it does end up looking like this abbreviated seated man sign. Um, yeah. I mean, that's kind of one of those things where 
I, I know I say all this all the time, but like uh, reading hieratic, even for an ancient Egyptian scribe, reading hieratic, it, the value of a given sign was not necessarily super important. What was really important was the sequence of recognizable things that you can reconstruct a known word from. So a lot of times with these little signs, uh, even in transcriptions, you'll see people transcribe them with like the Z5 sign or with a dot because they're not really anything. It's just, we know what goes there in like the full hieroglyphic spelling of this word. Presumably the scribe knew what was supposed to be there and they just abbreviated it with like a little tick. This is the same thing people do in modern handwriting as well. Yeah, I think this for me gets into like gestalt theory of here's the shape of the word. They yep. were familiar with the shape of the word they supplied any missing pieces yeah yeah because i'm and not it's, familiar with it yeah <laughs> yeah then then you really have to look at it and be like what is that thing but imagine for a right. native speaker of this language who knew the script quite well they just knew what was supposed to be there so they didn't care that it was just a little squiggle just, yeah 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 okay um on the line above uh the herjed and ba nebjedet um what's going on above that n is it is it just a smudge uh, this is a lacuna. Oh, oh, okay. Isn't that a pain in the ass, right? It's like <laughs> it really looks like ink because it's the same did... dark as the N. Because we photographed the papyrus against a black background it's... of oh, all the colors stupid. you might choose for the background. That is literally the worst one you could possibly choose. Um, I don't know if I told you all about this, but I had a project. I might have, if I've told you this before, I'm sorry, but. I was working on a project with a colleague who's a grad student at the IFA and we were like using the IFA lab and we made this special type of paint that was like, it had this, this chemical used in sunscreen in it. I forget the name of the chemical. It's like one of those really long names, but I, I bought some of this chemical from like a chemical supplier. I got this uh, paint, um, I got like UV brightener and then blue paint. And we made this special paint so that when you took a multispectral image, it would have this really strange, color characteristic. Like it would be black in UV, it would be uh, blue in like the visible light spectrum, and then it would be especially bright under, um, wait, I got it backwards. Oh, it would like, oh shoot, I can't remember. But it was like this whole complicated thing where if you like, if you take all the individual pixels and sort of plot them in like a five dimensional color cube going all the way from infrared to UV with like red, green, blue also, you would get the color of the background would just be its own sort of weird cluster away from any natural object you might ever photograph. So then you can totally extract the background kind of like a green screen in a movie um, and then know exactly where every lacuna is and, and not confuse it with ink. And we were working on that and we even did some tests and we took these like multi-spectral photos and we were supposed to present it at RC that year. And then um, our, our second, lab session uh, got canceled because of the COVID lockdown and we never got to, and then RC got canceled and we just never got to work on it ever again. And now I don't live in New York anymore. And so it's oh. just like, it just died. Uh, but we had this whole project going where we we're gonna like put out like, look, we made these special backgrounds that you can use to photograph ancient texts. And this should be the standard that everyone uses. So we never have this problem ever again. And we are gonna like solve that problem. And then COVID happened, so. This is what we get. Yeah. Huh. Wow. That's just the way. Yeah. Well, you should resurrect that. Um, also, the the ba right next to it is slight. Normally, it looks exactly like a paw with the wings like off to the side. And this time, I think they are here. I see them there. Yeah. So the yeah. The, the lacuna is exactly here, and so that's oh, that's I actually ink at the top. Yeah. Of it. <laughs> Stupid lacunas. All right. Never mind. Yeah. Getting me every time. You can kind of tell because they just are so inky black. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, with demotic text, it's freaking impossible, especially because if you like- It looks kind of like there's a fresh dip there though, because the ink itself is quite black right there as well. So it, it's yeah. almost an- Yeah, I mean, that is, that's really solid ink because that we can see it thinning here and then this mm -hmm. is the dip. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, with demotic right. text, you get like, you open up um, an, an old paper or something from 20 years ago and it's like a, 
Um, it's a black and white photo printed with that like stippling style that uh, like printing used to use where you use like, like dithering basically of like little tiny dots. And you absolutely cannot tell what is a lacuna and what is actually ink. And mm -hmm. it's incredibly frustrating. Uh, I hear Pepperall just complain about it all the time. I really wish I could have fixed that once and for all, but yeah, maybe we'll resurrect it, who knows. When... All right, sorry guys, I got duped. I got duped by lacuna. Moving on. Yeah, you're not the first. You're in, you're in very good company with that. Um, if you want to gripe at anyone, gripe at whoever thought to mount these papyri on black backgrounds. Because it's just so odd. Like, why wouldn't you at least put them on blue? It's it's the most contrasting color to the material and the colors on the papyrus. It's just, ah, I can't understand that. Anyway. Okay. Enough of me ranting. Who wants to go next? Oh, we got 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll do, we'll do one more section. Okay. I can take one. Um, um, Mustafa, did you, sorry, Aurelio, I think Mustafa said he wanted to do it. Did you oh, say that? You yeah, 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 actually, yes. Uh, my okay. voice com coming here, right? Yeah. Okay. When in uh, when in ta peseju peseju her jeden jehuti emba neb er e jar. Let's do just let's do just actually it is it's finished. Uh, then the enet. Uh, the Enet was saying to Jehuti uh, in, in, presence, in presence of a uh, Lord to the completeness. Yep. Uh, okay. Ich Iri Ek Ucha. Uh, and net uh, net uh, where um, nature mute her ren and neb 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 erger ka Come, come, met ka. I don't know how to. Oh, it's just ka. ka. That whole thing is just ka. ka. Okay. Uh, her, her, ip, you know. Yeah. Okay. Then the translation should be if it is. Uh, eject no preposition or something. Article. Inter interrogative. It's not interrogative. It's like um, consecutive or whatever. It's like uh, so. It's basically just so. Okay. So you so you did you or you make forget. Yeah. Uh, it's not the word forget. Mm. This is uh, like a letter. Ucha is, is letter. It's just like um, in Wenamun or in our Lady Egyptian class, we have uh, Ucha like commission. Um, it's related to the word wish, but it's like a it, it's just letter. Hmm. Okay. Then you, uh, so you make, you, you made, uh, ma made a letter of uh, great um, wait who's great, this uh, hmm? who's this person hmm. not neat yeah neat it is Got a it. little different uh, and <laughs> you know uh, neat 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 uh, determinative is also different yeah. 
something like two bow. Something. Yeah, she she also does have a T in her name, right? Neat. It's neat. Whereas Newt, uh, the yeah. T is not really there. It's it's Nui. Her name is Nui. Neat is actually just neat. Um, so who's neat? Then mm -hmm. neat war uh, war uh, nature mute the great divine mother. Yeah, um, so there's honorific, the great, great mother of God. Yeah, great mother of God. Great neat mother of uh, God. Great neat, the mother of God. Uh, Ren, Ren and Neb Erger. Um, I'm not sure about Ren means as a verb. It's not a verb. It's, saying or something like that. It's in the in the name of, like she's she's. I'm sorry, not she. He, um, Von Ebjed oh, is damn. writing a letter under the authority of uh, the Lord to the Limit. On the name, then we can say on the name of. On the name of Lord to the completeness. Yep. Ka. Uh, her ka her heri ip ka I don't know where to put ka, but after that heri ip means in the midst of and you know in the middle of in the midst of a heliopolis. Yeah, Oni. The actual name is Oni, so you can say that too. Um. Yeah. Oni. Okay. So. So there's one thing that I have to point out, and that is this, this is actually not a past tense sedgemf. This is a, uh, like an optative sedgemf. So you should make a letter to Neat, uh, the great mm. mother of God, et cetera. Um, and then Ka means bull. So, and it's often used for kings and for gods. He is the bull who is in the midst of Heliopolis. Um, and that's uh, okay. like, Bulls are associated with virility, so they're associated with kings and gods. It's like he is the bull who is in the midst of Oni. Okay. Question. Yeah. Peter. You got Quick a little question pointer. about the A. I'm sorry. A2. Yeah, I think that's A1. A2, thank you. Determinative. That's part of Ren, right? It is, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, me. Not, it's not always required, but it um, in, in uh, the New Kingdom on, you often see it. In Middle Kingdom Ren, you often see with, with no classifier whatsoever. Uh, but later on, you start seeing either this, um, the, the A2, or sometimes you even see the little cartouche as a, as a determinative, a little cartouche mm -hmm. after the word Ren. It's kind of cute. Cool. Anyway, okay, let's look at hieratic real quick, and then we definitely have to go. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll draw my little connecting lines that everyone enjoys. Jer is one we haven't seen much. There's not much to see here either. And I can't off the top of my head remember what it should normally look like, but that's definitely it. Um, Falcon on a stick here. I think it does normally look like something like that. It's just like uh, vertical, uh, horizontal at the top, and then some squibbles, squiggles in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then E, that's all good. Uh, papyrus roll, a little Z there. Uh, eerie Ek, oh man, that's. I would Quick not have got that from that hieratic. Yeah. Jer, that's a like like a, a cornice on top of a pillar. Is that right? With things attached to it? I think it's a bundle of uh, it's a sheaf. Sheaf? Is that a word? Sheaf. Okay. It's a sheaf. Like a like a bundle of something. Like bundle of straw or... with, with ears at the top. Oh, okay. That's cool. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which Why one? one is sign actually? Which character are we on? Sorry, confused. I didn't understand Sorry. your question. Can you say again? Yeah, I'm saying which, uh, which signs are we on? Oh, yeah. we're talking about the Jer sign, this one. Oh, we're still Jer. Okay, got it. You'll see it in uh, cursive hieroglyphs, something like this. 
like vertical lines that gradually start to lean at one end and get straighter towards the back. And then a little, uh, this knot shape where you see just like um, a little loop and then a tail that's very common, like throughout Egyptian iconography as like a knot. You'll see it, uh, men will often have it on the front of their kilts. Uh, it's just a schematic symbol of like a knot viewed from the side. Uh, so probably just like a simple, like a, a bow, right? And one of the loops and then the tails. Um, so yeah, that's like a bound uh, little bundle of stuff. Chief, Jer. Uh, what else do we have? I think I think we covered, I mean, this, this is a cool one because you can actually see the unligatured version of the ta, which does show up occasionally. Much rarer than the ligatured version, but there it is. You can plainly see the T and the A shape. This all looks good. Obviously we have a break here. So this is a little scribbly, but there it is. Again, our weird hair, which to me just looks like this. Doesn't look like hair at all, but that's that's what we got here. Um, our very vertical quail chick. Uh, not super clear, ha. Huh? You got something like that. Uh, that's, that's what it is. So it's here, this, and then a really long bottom. And then the Aleph bird, the Fech sign, loop, loopy thing. That's like cloth or papyrus or whatever. The N is actually here. It's there, it's just really tiny. And it's kind of joined to the T and meat. Uh, this is actually a second T. I think my transcription could even properly include a second T there because that's what's written. Um, big giant were bird, not sure, moot, little punched vulture, delightful. It's even got his little long pointy beak. Love it. Interesting uh, falcon on a stick sign where they've connected them like this instead of having them separate. Yeah, it's all there. Nice caw sign with little hands. Good, good chair sign there, really clear. Here we've got this, and then R inside of it. The bull is like absolutely is, terrible. Yeah, weird to me, but- uh... It's like nothing, there's like nothing there. Yeah, you just have to know. But we have we have the the caw hands and, I mean, I guess that's a penis, you know. Whatever. Okay, and on that note, um, we'll go to. Oh, we're late. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, everyone. Okay, we gotta go. Uh, I'll see y'all the next time. Bye, everyone. Yeah.